Hands down, no comparison, doesn't even come close. The best 5.7 hours in my entire logbook was when I got to get my seaplane rating up in Alaska flying a Piper Super Cub, which is awesome because I already had some Super Cub experience, but this time it was on floats. And immediately once we got to the airplane, I realized we're not in Kansas anymore. And it starts with the pre-flight. Normally pre-flighting airplanes, super simple. You do your walk around, you do your checklist, etc. But when it's on floats, that presents a unique issue. How do you get to all parts of the airplane to actually pre-flight it? So you start with one half of the airplane and, and you inspect the float and you do your normal pre-flight and things, but what about getting to the other side of the airplane? And this is where things get interesting. In order to get from one side of the airplane to the other, you have to walk the wire. So there's a wire connecting uh, the, the front part of the floats and you just have to balance yourself, kind of holding onto the prop to get from one side to the other. I'll throw a picture up on the screen. Now don't leave me a comment saying, hey, you gained weight. I know I gained weight. I'm working on it. I've already lost 10 pounds and it's going to be awesome. So just hang in there with me. But the point is, I want to show this picture just for aviation sake to show that's how you get from one float to the other. So the pre-flight is done very carefully, very slowly because the only thing separating you from the fish that you're staring at down below you is that tiny, tiny little piece of wire that you just swear is going to break, but every single time it doesn't break. But you get from one float to the other and you have to pump the floats out uh, to, to remove the water and stuff in it. So very carefully you do your pre-flight. And then getting in the airplane gets really interesting because as soon as you start the engine, you are moving. And so you're you're not really in a plane, you're, you're kind of in a boat. So getting your seaplane rating is a lot of your plane, your boat, your plane, your boat. And it goes back and forth based on what phase of flight you are in. But as soon as you start that engine, you are moving. There's no neutral like a boat. You can't just kind of park it. So if the engine is on, you are moving. And that takes some getting used to. I've got some boating experience, so that really came in handy, honestly. But you really have to get used to it. So you start taxiing around the lake. The next thing you're probably wondering is, well, how do you do your run-up? You're moving. And the answer is, yeah, exactly that. You are moving. And so you have to do your entire pre-flight uh, or a run-up checklist moving through the lake. And so it's this interesting dynamic of going through the checklist and doing your run-up and your mag check, which, you know, you got to increase the RPMs to do it. So all of a sudden you're moving a little bit faster. You're <laughs> thinking, okay, I got to make sure to look ahead here to know where I am on the lake so I don't hit anything while we're doing our checklists and our run-up and stuff. And that was an interesting new dynamic. You just always have to be cognizant of the fact that, oh gosh, I'm a boat right now. I'm, I'm hardly an airplane and I need to be cognizant of that. And I can't stop unless I turn the engine off. So when you go to take off, uh, the first thing we'd always always do is we, we pull the little rudders. So there's rudders on the back of the floats that that way when you're slow you have a lot more directional control instead of just using the tail. And, and so you've got the rudders in the water and m my instructor said hey for every time you forget to do this, you owe me a six pack of beer. And I will say, I never ended up having to buy her a beer because uh, luckily I didn't forget to do this. But you'll pull, with the, at least in the Super Cub, it's, literally, it's just a mechanical thing. So you just pull up on this little handle uh, that, that, that pulls a wire and then it pulls the, uh, the rudders out of the water. So you need to do that so you don't actually drag them through the water. During the takeoff, you pull that up and then you're steering with the tail. So when you're slow, you don't have as much directional control. So now you can kind of feel that or like, okay, we need to get going. And as soon as you put the power in, really the, the airplane really kind of comes back on its floats. And so you get pushed back in your seat and then you finally have some directional control again because you've got enough air going over your tail so where you've got rudder control. And really it's not too much different than taking off a normal airplane. You just keep it aligned. There's still, you still need right rudder and everything. And what will happen is, is the airplane will start to plane up. Um, and so it'll get on the part of the, the way that the floats are designed is that you can, it's called the step. And so you can step taxi or you can be on the step to where it's kind of like boats planing out, you know, whenever there's less drag because they're getting, they're going faster and they're kind of getting on top of the water. Same thing happens with seaplanes. And so you can feel that in takeoff. You go from being really, really mushy and kind of angled back to all of a sudden kind of coming forward on onto the floats and you're on the step. And now you can really see, okay, we're riding, we're, we're really gaining momentum. And when you take off, this is one of the most beautiful parts of flying a seaplane. When you take off, you can really feel just all of a sudden released and unburdened from the drag that all of the water is causing you. And it gets really smooth all of a sudden, you know when you're in the air, and it kind of feels like you, you leapt forward. It almost feels like you jumped out of the nest or something and started flying. It's, it's, it's a really cool moment, and every single takeoff feels uh, slightly magical for, the, for that regard, because you're, you're, the engine's going, it's bumpy, there's tons of drag and friction and stuff, and then all of a sudden, ha, ah, like here we are, and we just kind of leapt into the air. And that, and that was never lost on me. That was always a really fun part of taking off a seaplane. 
And then once you're flying around, really it flies just like a normal airplane. If anything, those floats kind of stabilize it because there's some weight, you know, kind of kind of pulling down in the center of the aircraft that kind of stabilizes it. And so it's really not too different than flying a normal uh, normal Super Cub in that regard. So where you start to realize, okay, I'm a seaplane again, is during landing. And my favorite part about flying seaplanes is in the landing here, and it's for this reason. Obviously, you're landing on water, but it's because water goes from being an obstacle to being an opportunity. And so it's a really fun, creative thing about flying seaplanes that whenever you have a body of water that you're going to go land in, there's no defined runway. You get to pick your own runway. You get to create your own runway. And you do so based on the winds, based on maybe where you're trying to go in the lake once you land. You're going you're gonna to have in mind all of the obstacles and, and the approach. Like, is there a mountain on, on some side of this? And so during your training, one of the things you'll do is you'll look on the whiteboard and they'll draw a hypothetical lake. And they'll say, there's rocks over here. There's a mountain here. Here's the prevailing winds. Where are you going to land? And that was always so fun because, you, you know, the, your instructor would say, okay, where are you going to land? And, and you'd say, okay, well, I'm thinking here because of this, this, and this. They say, okay, all right, let's do it. And you just get to make it up and have your, your creativity really come through, which is super fun. And so landing uh, is just awesome because you're, you're not used to being that close to terrain. So you're coming in over trees, you're by water, and it's just a really unique experience because you're not staring at a runway, you're just staring at nature and, and you get to land. And so landing really isn't all that hard. I will say though that, that interestingly, one of the harder landings is actually when the water is completely smooth, it's glass. And so this is called a glassy water landing. And you, you would think, hey, well, if the water's smooth, wouldn't that be a lot easier to land? Cause it's just, it's like pavement, it's just perfectly smooth. And the problem is because it's so smooth, when you look down, I'll show a video here, all you see is the sky. It perfectly reflects the sky, and so you can't see where the water starts and where it stops. And so judging your height above the water becomes impossible because you literally can't see the water. And, and I experienced this firsthand. You, you'll, you'll simulate it in training, but we got to go do the real thing. The conditions uh, created a glassy water landing. So the way you do that is, is right as you come over uh, the trees to the start of the water, you need to be in, in landing attitude and landing configuration. And I know, I know this because the check ride, I had to do this twice because I wasn't, I was still kind of, kind of angled down. I was still kind of coming towards the water when the trees stopped and the instructor or the, the uh, examiner immediately said, do that again, because you need to be in landing attitude as soon as you come over the trees, because at that point you can no longer see the water. So you don't want to accidentally dive down into it. So when you come over the trees, you need to be in landing configuration and then you basically hold hold an airspeed and then and then just use your power to get 100 to 150 foot per minute descent and so it's kind of like an instrument approach a little bit you're kind of flying your instruments and just kind of waiting 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 and all of a sudden the floats will touch and so you, you end up eating up a lot of the lake because you're just holding that descent and just waiting for the floats to touch but that that was so so magical so landing is is super fun and then once you land you gotta you know all of a sudden the, the airplane will want to start going to the left left turning to tendencies and so you got to reach down and put the rudders back down into the water but don't forget to put them back up before you take off or else you owe your instructor a beer. Once you land, honestly, this is this is where really the challenge begins. This is the hardest part of learning to fly a seaplane for me was docking, surprisingly. Because remember, as I was talking about, in flying a seaplane, at some points, you're a plane, then you're a boat. You're a plane, then you're a boat. Well, when you're docking, you're very much a boat that can't stop. And unless you have reverse thrust, like, like in some bigger turbine airplanes and things, like in the Super Cub, the only way to stop is just to turn the engine off. And so the way that you dock it is you basically just have to point yourself in your best guess direction, factoring in the winds, and, and you know, just, just pointing yourself right to where you think you're gonna make it. And then at the appropriate moment, which you have to judge when that is, you just shut the engine off. And not only do you shut it off, you get out of the airplane and you go stand out on the float, which is a funny, funny feeling standing on the edge of this float as you're just kind of still making momentum and hopefully headed towards the dock and not towards any other airplanes. And you kind of feel like you're Washington, I think that, that, that picture of like Washington crossing the Potomac uh, of like standing out there on the edge of the boat, kind of looking for that. That's how you kind of feel at the end uh, of this float. And you're, and you're hoping like, I hope we're gonna make it. I hope we're gonna make it. Sometimes you have to use a paddle and, and kind of get yourself over. It feels like, it feels very unprofessional because you're like, oh man, this is embarrassing. I'm paddling a float plane as I stand out here by myself on the front of the float. Or the opposite situation, which you really want to avoid is coming in way too hot. You're saying, oh my gosh, we have way too much speed and I got to jump out and onto a dock and, and really try to slow down the momentum of this airplane, which can be really, really difficult to do. So 
there's this careful balance of saying, when, when, when do you shut this off? And you don't really know. And so you, it takes some practice and some experience and sometimes you get it wrong. And if you get it wrong and, and you're short, well, what do you do? If you're not gonna paddle, you gotta get back in the airplane, turn everything back on, do another lap and try it again. And I definitely had to do that. So docking was the hardest part because you're a boat even though you're in an airplane. As far as the check ride goes, it's really not that difficult. You, you obviously have, have your oral part of the exam and a lot of that talks through uh, situations. So you'll draw a lake on, on a whiteboard and you'll talk about how you would approach that situation and things. And, and that was honestly kind of more fun than anything else because it was just, you get to be creative like I was describing earlier. And then the flight itself, really you're just having to demonstrate the maneuver similar to a private uh, check ride and things. And so you're demonstrating different types of landing techniques. You, you have to do reduced power takeoffs which is interesting because you, you eat up a ton of the lake in the process because you're only taking off at, at reduced power and stuff. And so you really, really have to wait for that airplane to fly. But it really wasn't that hard. The only thing I had to redo was my glassy water landing for the reasons I described earlier. But the check ride was not hard. And so after, after we passed the check ride, we had the most amazing experience celebrating that because what we did is we took a 180 on floats and my dad and my instructor and I, we went out to one of the lakes we had been training at. It's called Pineapple Lake. I don't know why it's called Pineapple Lake. Your guess is as good as mine, so leave me a comment down below and we can we can guess all day why we think it's named that. But we flew out there and as soon as we landed, weather came down and it was raining and it actually started hailing. And so we, we had to had to kind of huddle under the wing of the airplane as it was kind of docked to the shoreline and things. But as quickly as the weather came in, it, it left. And we had brought some rafts, some inflatable rafts that, that we blew up, and we brought some beer and some cigars. Don't worry, our, our instructor who was PIC was not drinking, but my dad and I were. And so we each had our own raft and we brought our fishing equipment and we were in this mountain lake and we were just catching rainbow trout after rainbow trout, floating around the lake together, smoking cigars, having a good time, just celebrating this. But the coolest part of this whole experience for me was looking back to the seaplane and realizing, gosh, that thing, that thing is what enables this right here. This is the type of experience that we can have that's uniquely enabled by a seaplane. And for that reason, I absolutely want to own a seaplane in the future. It, it's the most transformational six hours in my logbook, even though that's a very small percentage of my overall hours, because uh, I think that just really encapsulates what flying is all about, the adventure, the responsibility, uh, the newness, the, the, the freedom of all of it. I think a seaplane is what most uniquely demonstrates what it's all about. And so that was super transformational for me. And an, uh, an equally transformative flight was when I got to fly in a jet, in a cockpit for the first time. And I recount that story right here. And so equally awesome as the seaplane rating was, this experience was as well. So I encourage you to watch that video and I'll see you there.